Simon Parkin. BBC Radio Somerset. So it's Tuesday morning. It is June the 2nd. Thanks for choosing to spend your Tuesday with us. Now, of course, it's not unusual for a personal tragedy to change the path of someone's life. But after losing her daughter in the most terrible of circumstances and the despair that came after it, Janetta Barry has used her own experiences to help her move forward and become an expert in trauma and crisis management. Janetta is with us. Morning, Janetta. Good morning, Simon. Thank you. And it's a pleasure to be with you today. Well, it's lovely to have you here. Just just give us a bit of a, 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 an explainer into um, the kinds of things that someone who deals with trauma and crisis management is talking about on a daily basis. Well, especially now over these last couple of months, um, I mean, the whole world is in crisis. So the conversations have increased uh Extensively, you know, you, you find that everybody all around the world is needing help to deal with crisis. Uh, so it's anything from just dealing with the lockdown to the dynamics that come with it, uh, warring couples, um, abuse, uh, a lot of people who now lock down any fears that they uh, were able to deal with through distraction now don't have the distraction. Uh, suddenly the volume dial going up on on that and dealing with a lot of children at the moment as well so it's it's been an interesting three months absolutely and and for you to to end up in the situation where you are part of the support team it's an interesting story of what took you there and a very sad story as well yeah, you know, I, I used to be a motivational speaker and uh, I realized that it didn't leave anybody with tools and that they were coming back to get a dose of my energy. That's all they got from me. So for a while, I, I sat and worked on working on my intuition, which, of course, uh, helps tremendously in dealing with business. And then I realized that people were still coming to me and wanting to uh, find out whether my intuition could guide them. So I, at the time I was questioning this, um, one day my 16-year-old daughter Jenny and I had an enormous argument. And um, I was putting safekeeping house ground rules into place because she was breaking them. And she stormed out really very angrily and left to pack to leave home. And I sensed after a while that something wasn't right and I, I went to look for her and I found her hanging with a broken neck in her shower. I mean, what an, uh, an incredible thing to, to go through and, uh, you know, to get beyond the, the, that experience it must just take years and must be a very difficult progress. It was. It was extremely difficult, especially as I didn't have very effective tools to deal with it. So it felt like I'd stepped into this black, dark hole that I was trapped in. And it was almost like a, a lifetime prison sentence. And it, it, it just felt never ending and uh, Quite honestly, I came three times to nearly ending my life because I just couldn't, I couldn't work out how one could ever move beyond something like this because it has a knock on effect. It, it affects uh, every part of your life. So just about every part of my life went to ground zero. And when anybody dies, the, there is the, well, the, there's the stages of grief, obviously, that you go through, but one of them is anger and there is anger with you know, if they die in hospital, it's the medical team who could have done more or it's the, you know, we should have moved faster. When someone so close to you takes their own life, I, I guess you're, you're always wondering what else could I have done? Why didn't I spot? Why didn't I see those signs? And I guess sometimes those signs just are not there to be seen. Yeah, especially for parents who had no idea their child was in that space. We, we had been walking a walk with Jenny. It was actually her fourth attempt. So, um, but it didn't make it any easier. And, and, and yes, how do, you, how do you deal with that? You know, when it's in somebody else's hands, it, it's difficult enough. But when you feel directly responsible, 
uh, it, it's huge to try and, and, and embrace. Having said that, dealing with grieving people worldwide, I've worked with people who have had to deal with terrorist attacks and been in terrorist attacks, lost loved ones, um, cyberbullying, all that sort of thing. Having said that, in actual fact, there's a common denominator that, that runs through all grieving, uh, which actually operates in cycles more than stages. And that common denominator is that it's the, the guilt, shame, and pride. I pride that I was this for this person, and I feel guilty and ashamed that I didn't make those standards. And it's that's what creates the what if and if only and it should have and I, I wish. And all that conversation is what grief comprises. And when you can take those conversations and powerfully turn them around into uh, new ways of understanding, then uh, the grief comes into a place of manageability. So don't get me wrong, I, I, I have this, this whole scenario to deal with for the rest of my life. It's not going away. But at the same time, I've been able to take, and it took me a long time, but eventually I got there. Now I can do it within next to no time with grieving people. But it took time for me to understand where the other side to what had happened was also existing. And once I was able to get that consciously and unconsciously, I was able to step into a place of acceptance, uh, even appreciation, grace uh, for what had happened, but still understanding that anniversaries are anniversaries and, uh, you know, there, there, there'll still be times where it's difficult, but it's, it's manageable with an open heart now. And... Because you are so open about the experience that you had, I guess that means that the people who you are empathising with when you are supporting them will appreciate that, that you know, because we all go through things that we don't necessarily know anybody else understands how we feel, whatever it is. You know, that you, you just don't know what I'm going through. When people realise that, that you perhaps do know what they're going through, does that give them more of a trust in you? Does that give them more of a faith in you? Or do you think it's just the openness to listen that probably makes all the difference? I think it's a combination of both. Uh, definitely, because I have walked the walk and talked the talk, people trust me more because they go, she, she knows the pain we're feeling. She really understand it, understands it. And then I am able to listen. And one of the, the, the special things about the process I work is that it's not regurgitating the story each time and with... Uh, the person I'm working through, it, it enables them to peel that story away, which usually binds and, and controls you, and start new conversations through a series of asking themselves questions. And when they start answering those questions, new, more powerful, empowered conversations start happening. And uh, then they can see, oh, now we understand. Because a lot of people go, is Janetta really for real? I mean, can you really get over something like that to the degree that she talks about? And once my client has sat down and started working with me, they go, ah, now I get it. That's amazing. Uh, and, it, and it works on such deep levels. So it's really very effective. Throughout all of the, the lockdown period and the confusion that has come with the speed at which coronavirus overtook all of our lives, the clients that you've been working with and you've you've checked with them that they're happy for us to, to talk about some of their experiences, though not name them obviously, but what kind of things have you have you been been up against when people have been trying to make some sort of sense of the situation? Yeah, I, I had a couple in uh, Botswana in lockdown, which was very strict lockdown. Uh, you had to get a, a, a permit to leave the house, and that was almost impossible to get. Uh, really, in a very bad place, who are now sitting in a better form of conversation and understanding and appreciation than before lockdown even happened. Um, 
a little girl in New York, uh, five years old, where one of mum's most uh, biggest worries was that this little person would one day could possibly be uh, kidnapped. She, she lives in Brooklyn. And lockdown happened and unbeknownst to mum, five-year-old had picked up on that story. And suddenly her volume dial went high and she started panicking that when lockdown was over, she would get kidnapped. So uh, those are two examples. Uh, I've also got um, <laughs> three, three, three children under the age of 13, three boys, three brothers in Australia who are all autistic now in lockdown. And uh, the level of not being able to cope with each other even went to, I'm going to kill you type of conversation. And uh, they've been, in fact, have just finished a session with the middle child before this call. And uh, this child who could hardly talk to me and uh, <laughs> sits on his neck with his head up in the air when he processes with me, uh, couldn't wait to tell me what had happened that had worked during this last week with him and his brothers and his life in general and was very verbose. So new conversations and uh, deeper levels of understanding with those, those by way of example. And I mean, such a diverse range of, of experiences that you just talked us through there and the people going through them. When you are obviously, you know, perhaps seeing that, that what you're saying is making a positive difference, you are helping them move forward through whatever it is they're going through. Do you not then take on some of their despair and their anguish too? Do you not end every day needing a hot bath to try and, you know, cleanse your mind of, of the challenges that they're facing that you in turn are facing with them? Yes, you know, one would think that that would be. And I think with uh, conventional therapy, a lot of that happens. But uh, because the outcomes are so swift with this process within the first session of half an hour, the person's already able to start uh, explaining how different they feel and the breakthrough they've had. And uh that's really in inspiring. There are times where I might have a really, really tricky client that's holding on to whatever it is, a bit like a security blanket. That's when I get exhausted is, is in assisting them to put the security, the emotional security blanket down. But it's very few and far between that that happens because most of my clients are really ready and sick and tired of that emotional security blanket and they're ready to throw it in the bin if they haven't already. And so the process works smoothly because they're ready to do what it takes to do what they want to get out of it. Obviously, you're, the process that, that you deal with, the, the clients that you deal with, you spend time with them it, that we haven't got on the radio just now but you know in a, is there a, a bit of advice that you could give anyone who has for whatever reason found the lockdown uh, quite challenging yes yeah, certainly I think the big thing with this process uh, which I called the epiphany process uh, and and uh, got the basics of and fine honed and expanded and brought it to what it is today. The big thing is to understand that we're in a society that's mostly attached to having to be positive, which really puts you into judgment of all the negative side of your persona, which means that you're judging half of who you are. And when that happens, the internal conversation is very judgmental half the time, if not more, because we tend to concentrate on that. So it's not saying that one shouldn't be positive because that's very important too, but it's being able to address the negative and find its value instead of judging it and saying that you should eliminate all negative thought, word, and deed. There's always, if you've got the balance, you look at how electricity works in a cycle um, you can't have positive without negative charge in a cycle of electricity otherwise things go quite awry and our psyches operate in exactly the same way so when you're able to start listing where the negative side of who you are your your qualities your traits and what's happened to you 
have served you to the same degree that they haven't and where you can start listing where the positive hasn't served you to the same degree that it has when you've got those equal lists in place then a balance of understanding on a really unconscious level kicks in as much as you consciously understand it so i have clients coming to me sometimes after their first session within days i'll get a phone call saying you know Janetta, I've just had a, a conversation with great uncle Harry and I hate him. I hate his guts. And if I've said two words to him in the last 20 years, it's a lot. And I had a half an hour conversation with him uh, deep from my heart. And I was able to safely speak my truth without judgment or fear. And that's what uh, being able to address the negative side of you are of what you are positively uh, produces. Well, it's really fascinating talking to you today. Thank you ever so much for your time. Um, Janetta's uh, theory is called the Epiphany Process. You can find out more if you have a look online. Uh, Janetta Barry there speaking to us about how she took her own experiences and moved forward in a way that means she now helps and supports others. It is 10.34. It's BBC Radio Somerset.